Hey, Sandra Grover here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to a science fiction topic, a uh, science fiction video. Very excited to talk about these things. And what I want to talk about today is this misconception of what science fiction should be. And that is an unwarranted criticism of science fiction or, or an unnecessary criticism of science fiction. To give you some context, I had recently read, uh, I think last week, Isaac Asimov's story, Nightfall. This is a wonderful short story. I give it a five out of five stars. Well paced. The tension is just right. It reaches to a climax and and it has a very, very thought-provoking conclusion. It's a very, very well-written short story. Last week, I had uh, read it through an audio drama, and so the tension was just, it was just perfect. The acting, all of it was really great. Now, I had read this story about five or so years ago on a lunch break. I read it as a book, you know, inside a book, um, not, not as an audio drama, and it still holds up. I, I was blown away on a lunch hour, and I remember, you know, it was it was cool enough where I could read in my car, and I was just, you know, spending lunch reading the story, and I'd just go in, and I remember my supervisor saying, Michelle, what's wrong? And, and I said, I just read a really good short story by Isaac Asimov, and, and I was, I remember being blown away by it. Now, fast forward five or so years later, I listened to the audio drama, and it still holds up. It's still a very, very good story. And basically, I'll get into my point of the um, unwarranted criticism of it, um, not by me, but by other people. Um, but basically, to give you a, a little bit of a premise of the setting, it takes place in a world where there are six suns um, orbiting around this planet, or the, I, I should say the planet is um, um, in its orbit is going through uh, different suns and sunlight. And because of that, the, the planet is, it's, it's heavily implied that the, the planet is in this perpetual light. It could be yellow light of, of, you know, the sun that we have here on Earth. It could probably be an orange light or a red tint, depending on the sun, because there are six suns. Um, but at uh, about 2,500 years, every 2,500 years, there is this um, rare part of the cycle, you know, you know, probably the cycle of the galaxy. I don't know how it's really explained. Um, but every 2,500 years, um, the, the planet is fixed in a position where the other sun's light is not quite there. And then also another sun, a, a smaller sun, is about to be eclipsed. So because of the eclipse and because of its you know, the planet's actual physical location, the light actually recedes and goes away to give the planet momentary darkness for, for the first time in 2,500 years. Now, that, that's pretty interesting, this, this idea of society always having light, perpetual, they, uh, perpetual light. They have no concept of dark. They have no concept of night. They, ha they cannot conceive of something like starlight. And so this idea of an eclipse and uh, really of a, of a doomsday you know, the, 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 there's a cult in the story, a religious cult, you know, that the, the eclipse is, is pretty much the taking up of, of souls and, you know, the, the religious people, the devout people are, are going to be uh, brought to heaven uh, among the stars and then everyone is, you know, doomed uh, and condemned. Um, so you have a kind of a, a cultish setting and then you have, you know, scientists and then you have um, a, psycho a psychologist and then you have a main character who's a news reporter and he, he's got the biggest story of the, uh, of the, the times where he's going to report on this uh, momentary darkness, you know, this, this nightfall. So basically the setting is how, how is a world that is just constantly surrounded by light, how is a world of people going to respond to a momentary darkness, a momentary nightfall? Well, it, it's very interesting. Uh, Isma, um, Isaac Asimov plays... Um, uh, he plays it into the hands of um, psychology and sociology. How would civilization respond to such a change, something that they're not used to? Um, and I just don't want to go into the details. I'll probably review this short story another time. Uh, but it's, it's wonderful. If, if you can uh, get your hands on the radio drama, I highly, highly recommend it. So that's, that's the setting, that the planet is um, 
uh, orbiting in its orbit is facing in in some way in some um, respect one or two uh, at least two actually at least two of the six suns and so great short story but there was, I had read some very unwarranted criticism of the story. And that is, well, you know what? That That's preposterous. There's no planet that can have six suns around it. That's astronomically impossible. And therefore, if it's scientifically impossible, therefore it's not a good science fiction short story. And I want to say the opposite. I'd actually like to argue against that. Just because something is highly, highly, highly improbable or maybe absurd or even physically or scientifically impossible in our world, in our in our space, is something that we cannot conceive of this physical world. That doesn't mean just because it's there here, you know, it's it's impossible here with us. Well, that that doesn't mean that's gonna make the science fiction story bad. So just because the science is outlandish or the setting is a little bit atypical or even impossible. Just because it's impossible does not mean that the science fiction is bad. So that's that's one thing I really want to point out is that people do have the tendency of criticizing science fiction when the science is not right. But we got to remember, it's science fiction. It's not science facts. If you want science facts, you can go to many science scientific magazines and and have your way there. Now, science fiction the, the beautiful thing about science fiction is that it really can be for everyone if people look into it because it's so massive as far as genres and subgenres. You have hard science and you have soft science. Now, the people who would criticize Asimov for placing a, 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 a planet among six suns, well, maybe they would like hard science. You know, maybe they would like hard science fiction where... It's, it's about the actual science of traveling to Venus, for instance. It, it's not so much on story. It's not so much on psychology. It's not so much on interiority. It's uh, not so much on character development. It's not so much on plot, but it's mainly fixed on the hard sciences. We got to give Asimov a little slack. While he has incorporated some science in, in many, all of his short stories, he really dives into, much of his work dives into the psychology of the human condition, of the human race. So now we're getting into the soft science where, where conceptually you are working with socio-political things or, or psychology, so um, social things, psychological things, and then also political things. That, that all can be still under science fiction. So the premise of his short story, Nightfall, is, is really how would a world of people not used to darkness respond to the dark? That is all he meant to display. That is all he meant to do with this really wonderful, very short, very tense, very terrifying short story. How, how do people respond? They don't respond that well. I'll just give you a hint there. Um, but that, that's his whole point. You can, when you're, when you're a science fiction writer, maybe you are thinking about writing science fiction. Yeah, you can go for the hard sciences too, but maybe you want to go for the conceptual. Isaac Asimov, I will say right now, he's not so much known for his prose or his narrative or his plot or his characters as much as he is known for his ideas. Now, in, in the modern day reading sensibilities, I really would say, yeah, have a good idea for science fiction, but you got to have good characters and you got to have a good plot. That's just our sensibilities now. But Isaac Asimov, with his time, especially in the 1950s, you know, World War I was a memory, but it was still kind of a, you know, people do, did remember World War I and definitely World War II. There were a lot of um, sociopolitical changes where people really turned to pulp fiction. They, they turned to the fantastical. They turned to the absurd because they were using the, absurd, the absurdity to, you know, to question the existence of man, the reasoning of man. They, they had gone through so much bureaucracy and, and so much political upheaval. They were using science fiction to, to question the reasoning of mankind. That is perfectly legitimate for science fiction. Science fiction, I would say above every genre, 
I'm going to be bold to say that, science fiction is the one genre in which you explore the human condition. Yeah, you can do that with other genres, there's no question. But that is really the function, the overall function of science fiction. So it's not fair for someone if, if they critique a, a kind of setting as astronomically impossible, it's not fair to then say, well, that's a bad story because that science doesn't make sense. No, that's, that's, that's being hard on science fiction. And that's why I say give science fiction a break. Um, you, you have a plethora of different subgenres to turn to. If you like military travel, science fiction, do it. Um, but don't feel obligated as a writer, and especially as a reader, but as a writer, if you're writing science fiction, don't feel like, oh, I got to get that technology just right. Make it believable. Don't make it lazy, you know, and, and don't convolute your plot with different magical metaphysical science of sciences if it doesn't make sense to your plot. But I wouldn't be so hard on, especially someone prolific like Isaac Asimov, when his concepts were not only uh, engaging in their own right, but it was well executed in a short story format. So that is one thing. The second thing I want to say is that in our mindset of the 21st century, you know, the cultural mindset of the 21st century, we've actually um, become quite accepting of different things, uh, um, crazy things when it comes to science fiction. For instance, because of things like Star Wars, I don't know about Star Trek, but definitely with Star Wars, because of the visual entertainment and space of Star Wars, we've come to accept that we can hear blaster fire in space. We've come to accept sound in space. Most people know that space is a vacuum and that sound is void. Like there's, there's no sound traveling. We, we have things like radio signals and stuff like that, but no sound. But battles between fighter ships in space, we've come to accept that to be in science fiction, even though that's not possible to hear blaster fire. I mean, you know, as far as sound effects are concerned, it's like, well, yeah, we wouldn't hear it. We would hear something inside the realm of our fighter jet and, and space pod and all of that. But, you know, Star Wars is very different from 2001 Space Odyssey in that, yes, they actually did, you know, frame by frame, every time the, the shot panned out where you saw the Odyssey ship, you, you did see that there was no sound. It was all, it was just completely just all space, which is awesome. And then, um, then it made it for a very dramatic effect. For instance, when HAL 9000 kills, or at least I think he outright kills Frank Poole, the, the deputy of Bowman, the captain of the ship, um, when, when in the film, in the space, um, 2000 space, one, 2001 space odyssey film, um, when, when Frank Poole is suffocating to death, um, because of Hal, uh, having crashed, I think he crashes the pod into Frank Poole. Well, you see him suffocating and getting killed and there's no sound because they, they, the filmmakers and of course, Arthur C. Clarke with his input said, no, there's no sound in space. So you're not going to film it like that. Whereas with Star Wars, yeah, fighter pilots, you know, you can hear like the, the, the Doppler effect when they, you know. Um, was on by and we accept it we, so we accept both things we accept both sound in space and then also with Arthur C. Clarke we we accept no there's no sound in space so there, there is also that we also getting back to Star Wars we we have accepted of our science fiction entertainment we have accepted that fighter pilots and fighter jets really are fighting in space as if they were aerial fighters underneath the atmosphere of the planet we've accepted that now, we know actual Star Wars wars, you know, um, if it was put into the physical existence, that's not how space battle works. But Foundation Trilogy was about that. All sorts of military science fiction is about that. And of course, we get that, of course, from, from Star Wars. So even though it's absolutely impossible for, for space fighters to fight like aerial fighters underneath the atmosphere, we've accepted it. We've, that's fine. And that is science fiction. You can't call that science magic and stuff like that. We have accepted that. Our sensibilities, culturally speaking, has accepted that to be 
science fiction. So you don't even have to explain how fighter jets in space or, or uh, fighters, fighters, fighter ships. That's what I meant to say. You don't have to explain, oh, uh, what, what's causing them to turn around and, and tumble, uh, you know, and, and evade people and stuff like that. You don't have to explain the science behind that. People accept that that space battle is going to be what it's going to be, even if it's physically and scientifically impossible in our real world. So I wanted to get the, the misconception out of the way, the major misconception of science fiction in that, well, because it's impossible, therefore it's not a good science fiction story. No. Even if the science is absolutely impossible and absolutely absurd, it can still be a great piece of science fiction because you've got the hard science if you want to explain it, then you've got the soft science where it doesn't need to be ex explained. If it's, if it's a good enough story, it's a good enough piece for the science fiction world. That's all I've got to say. Thanks for watching and listening. And always, until I see you next, keep producing, promoting, and preserving the great art that you love. And I will catch you later.